I don't think I've ever set the stage for a show by saying, welcome to the future. Well, there's always a first time, I guess. I have just seen the future, and this is it. And I'm going to really love sharing it with all of you. It's called The Playground. It's a converted warehouse in the heart of the Bay Area, or what is often called Silicon Valley in California. The playground is the creation of some of the world's most brilliant and successful minds. Each one of its founders is a multi-billionaire, and I think this is one way they're giving their own success back to society. The playground is a space where these founders help young teams who have great ideas and help make those ideas a reality. So the aim of Playground is simply to discover young dreams and turn those dreams into reality. It's a mind-blowing new world. It's a glimpse of the future. And the future is now, right inside Playground. Let's take a look into this amazing future world of tech to understand what it does. I spent a couple of days inside Playground and to start the ball rolling, I spoke to my friend, Ajay Madhok, one of the most brilliant minds I've ever known. And since it's a playground, where did I find Ajay? Sitting on a swing, of course. Where else? No, it's amazing, this place. And you've been closely associated with the founders of Playground, uh, with Bruce Andy, and Bruce and Peter, and you're also very closely associated with them now. So what? What is it about Playground? What makes it tick and what makes it different? I think they've changed the game, the business of innovation. Okay. And uh, you know, when we were growing up, you know, capital was really very scarce and there was abundant talent. So you could right. do a Xerox Park, you could do an AT&T Bell Lab, right? But to raise money was tough. Money yeah. was tough, yeah. right? Today it has flipped. There is plenty of capital, at least here in the Silicon Valley, right. but talent has become extremely scarce. So under those circumstances, how do you innovate, scale it, you know, reliably, repeatedly, etc. So what Playground brings to the table is human capital and financial capital under one roof. Expertise, talent, and capital working together. Okay, both under one, they've got... Right, so they have this idea the of a yeah. okay. startup studio and VC under one roof. So, so when you say startup studio, what does it mean? We know what VCs are venture capitalists who provides money, takes risks, take, has faith in founders, etc. What is a startup studio? So VCs provide capital and accelerators, you know, they provide everything other than capital, like infrastructure and so on. A startup studio, one way to think about it is that imagine if you're building a spaceship, a rocket, you know, and a startup studio would be like a launch pad for that rocket. So it would be mission control, it would be ground staff, ground crew, everything that you need to go from zero to one. Okay. So it's this bunch of people that you see here yeah. who have been serial entrepreneurs, who have built products, taken many companies from zero to one who can help accelerate a new startup. When you say taking companies from zero to one, what do you mean by that? You have an idea. Right. One is a market outcome. One is a finally of marketing the product. Okay. So it could be any market outcome. Okay. Uh, so it could be taking the product to market, but transforming this idea into, into a market outcome is it. the journey that we say okay. zero to one. Oh, you could be bought out or something. That could be an exit. That's another yeah, market that's outcome. Market yeah. outcome. But and the reason why this works is what? The, the, the four, the founders here, and you're very, very closely associated with Playground. You come here almost every day. And I don't know how much work you do, but you pretend to work like all of us. But they, are, why are they 
ideal for any startup? Startup has uh, some challenges. So money and open source software has lowered their barriers to entry. But it's really about this journey from entry to exit where there are a lot of these pitfalls. It's like the snake and ladder game. You move and then a snake bites you, you come back down, right? So right. startup goes through that, you know. I have a vision, how do I translate that into a product that market right. would want? Right. So we call it product fit, market fit. What's my go-to-market strategy? What's the right insertion point? Pricing, first customer shipment. These are real challenges that every startup has. And they've so, done that. So what this expertise brings to the table is that you know, they help you avoid these early stage pitfalls. It's like playing chess with a grandmaster. They right? say they, they've been there, done that, and they say. Exactly. So they can a priori say, you know, uh, these five things we don't need to worry about. Let's think through these two. And So difference between a VC and playground is what? VCs provide capital. Yes. So they look at an idea, the team, the size right. of the market, and you know, they have certain heuristics to decide. It's a funding decision. Right. Here, you know, uh, they provide expertise as well. So oh, this is your funded. The VC plus. So they're a fund and a studio. Both, okay. So okay. they say, okay, you got funded. Okay, it's like you got selected to play cricket. Right. Now just bat well. <laughs> <laughs> so let me coach you on how to, you know, so bat they, well. So they both fund, but they look at the team, they look at the idea, they look at the founders, and they fund and they provide the expertise. Right, so they have two different business models. Okay. So studio's model is that I will take you from zero to one, right? and I will take a stake in the company. Okay. So For I don't want you. to charge you any money, but right. my fees are really helping you know, X you percent. time, etc. Right, so I take X percent, so I have real skin in the game. I want right. you to be successful. Right. The fund has a different uh, you know, business model, which is their investing in a portfolio of companies and they take an equity stake, but they're right. putting capital to get equity. Studio is right. putting talent to get equity. So the right. playground studio is the decision making uh, partner, we call it general partner of the playground fund. So they decide which investments to make and the right. studio says, let me take you from zero to one. So it is financial capital and human capital together. Got it, got it. That's a huge, I mean, Traditional VCs must be a little scared of a place like this. It's a, this is the breakthrough innovation model today. Breakthrough yes. innovation model. Mm -hmm. Finally, you know, I've walked around and been just fascinated, but one sort of common theme is AI everywhere. Um, how important is AI today and how is it going to change the future of all of our work and lives? You saw it, you know, I was trying to get an mm -hmm. internship here. Sherry said, you know, your job is not done by the cart. You know, <laughs> right. I could have only <laughs> brought <laughs> coffee. <laughs> so that job is gone. So right. I have to reskill myself. But jokes aside, uh, you know, just like uh, computing, when computing became cheaper and more reliable, it found many use cases beyond military and government. That's where it started. Right. And as it became uh, cheaper, uh, you know, the demand for its applications went up and today there is computing everywhere. We carry a computer with us, right? Yes. So, uh, same thing with AI. Uh, if you think about it, it doesn't really have intelligence or judgment just yet. But what it is good at is it can make sense of data to predict what the data is not, you know, directly telling you. It's like, okay. you know, we see something and we infer. Right. But it has many layers. But here, if you unbundle all those layers and just look at prediction, AI is very good at predicting. Okay. Right. So, for example, you know, autonomous vehicle. What would a human do if you can just predict that? Right. You have reimagined the problem. You have reframed the problem from an autonomous vehicle or autonomous driving right. to a prediction problem. So, so, what AI is doing is, it is lowering the cost of prediction and making it more reliable. So, it will fundamentally transform any business that uses decision making. So the cost yeah. of decision making comes down. So all decision making requires some, pre some, some element prediction. of prediction, so it uses AI and it'll be much easier. So the uh, textbook use cases are, let's say trading. You're trying mm. to predict will the stock move up yeah, or yeah. down, that's right? So that's an easy one. Yeah. But it could be, you know, um, uh, we have all experienced the transformative power of e-commerce. So, you know, uh, can Amazon, sh you know, ship before you shop? 
right? It can or predict what you might need tomorrow I, morning. Should I start selling this product or not? And how many should I produce? Right. So AI will look at behavioral aspects, the entire market, similar products, and give you a better idea of... So any workflow can be decomposed into tasks. So certain tasks would fall into this category of predictive, right. where right. you know you right. need right. to predict. Which is almost the basis of life. Right. 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 So anywhere you need a prediction... So is it going to be like... You know, when computers came in a long time ago, everybody thought that's the end of all jobs. But actually, computers have created more jobs by improving productivity, by making things that were previously impossible to imagine to, that could be done, are being done. Is AI going to, in your, I know it's difficult to tell, cut jobs or in increase jobs? Reskilled or not? Yeah. Uh, you know, think of economics of complements, right? So, for example, uh, Anything which can be substituted with a cheaper product will get substituted. Right, right. So if you think about decision making as prediction and intuition and judgment, so I can't substitute intuition and judgment, so those jobs will remain. But anything that is that doesn't really require that intelligence or that judgment, right, yeah. can be done better by a machine. Right, right. So those jobs will get replaced so by... So is it cor correct to say AI will, you lose certain types of job, but open a whole new world of uh, new kind of jobs with reskilling and like computers did? Yeah, so I think uh, the short answer is, uh, you know, we know how to create new problems. So there will always yeah. be new problems right. and machines will keep catching up. Okay, <laughs> right, that's lovely. So after that quick chat, Ajay and I enjoyed feeling some music. No, you didn't hear me wrong. Yes, I said feeling music. Now, this young startup has created a system which allows you to not only listen to music of your choice, you both listen Come on, and you sense the music's vibrations all over your body, just as though you're in a rock concert with gigantic speakers belting out good vibrations. And for me, it was back to Woodstock. And that's only the tip of the iceberg of innovations here at the playground. I decided to take a walk around this remarkable space with one of the founders, Peter Barrett. Peter Barrett is a technology genius. By the way, he's literally a rocket scientist and is known in the valley as the magician. He is head of technology at the playground. Just listen to some of the mind-boggling things he's doing and creating. For instance, one product they're creating is this. Like you can take a seed, plant it in the ground and it grows into a tree. Well, here they're working on seeds that you plant in the ground and it grows to create a house. A seed that grows into a building, end of the housing crisis in the world. Didn't I warn you? It's mind-boggling. It's a different world. It's the future. And the excitement here is contagious. So why do you call it the playground? You guys just pool around here? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a playground for engineers. The, the people who created this place have spent their entire careers making things, writing software, building hardware, and uh, now as you transition into being able to fund people creating new hardware and software, it really is a playground. We get to work with people who are much smarter and younger than we are, <laughs> but uh, we can provide the capital and uh, allow them to concentrate on making new mistakes. Taking You've it. done so much. So why do you come in here every day? Look, the, the opportunity to create new kinds of companies and new kinds of value for our, for our investors is important. Right. But for me personally, yes. I get to go home every day knowing something I didn't know where I came to work. Wow. And that's a, that's a fundamental pleasure. That's and, huge. And yes. the scientists yes. and engineers here are domain experts from everything from next generation computing uh, to new classes of hardware and software to new kinds of consumer experiences all of which I wouldn't get to, to intimately connect with if I just concentrated on my own career. Um, yeah, if you're in one organization. Just have a look at it here. If you can just explain what, what actually, they're kind of groups of startups here? Yeah, that's right. So we have about 10 of our portfolio companies living with us here in the facility. Okay. And that's everything from a six-person startup to I think about 140 people in the largest company. Wow. So there's 80,000 square feet mixed in our our employees who have created literally billions of devices of various kinds, and they help the portfolio companies build their organizations and their products. Right. 
Oh, so you have all these startups, and then you have a team of really high tech top people who help each of the startups. Is that yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. And they're wow. you know software engineers and electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, industrial designers, product people. Um, all the people you need to build a modern technology company. And they act as river guides to keep um, our portfolio on track and help them build their organizations. It, it just is amazing, the atmosphere. And, and uh, they don't need supervision to work hard. This wouldn't work in India because we need supervision. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they're uh, motivated. So. The, the nature of these startups, they are, tend to be driven, tend to be deeply curious. Yes. And, um, you know, the. The, the drivers of that desire to create, the desire to, to um, you know, to make a company that has a real identity, to make stuff that hasn't existed before, right. it keeps people pretty busy. And we'll go into some of the amazing things that are happening here, but let's just go downstairs and walk around a bit. Uh, you don't have stairs, so you'll take No. <laughs> Should we take the slide? Beginning of the end of this session. So, uh, up to you. all right. Let me see how it's done. Just be careful. It's a little faster than it looks. <laughs> oh, dear. Woo! Wow. Ooh. But I like the way it slows down at the <laughs> end. It's well designed. Well, you notice that some clothes are faster than others, and every now and then somebody will do one bounce and slide across the country. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just walk around. The, um, first of all, uh, the wonderful cafe you have here. Uh -huh. It's all, everything's free. Yeah, so we have, you know, some of the companies virtually live here, so giving them three hot meals a day keeps them happy and healthy. Also provides a community where the companies can share each other's experiences. Right. Uh, and we're also recruiting against Apple and Google and Facebook who are down the street, so right. providing some creature comforts really helps these companies hire the best and brightest. And I must say, what I'm also impressed by here is the music. It's all my generation. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a good choice of music. Well, your parents have. Yeah, so there's a, it, 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 switches, well brought up, it switches back and forth. But, um, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, there is, there is a multi-generations here. There's a, there's a mix of uh, old masters and young geniuses. So we're trying to teach the young geniuses the correct music. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you... Um, this is also a place where people can meet. I notice there's a couple of tables where you can actually use it as a whiteboard. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, so, and you often see people from different companies sharing ideas, right? Collaborating on, uh, yeah, because they're non-competitive, they do t yes. tend to help each other as part of a broader, l as if it's part of a broader whole. You don't take on two competitive uh, that's right. companies. That's right. That makes a lot of sense, yep. actually. So we'll come to, this looks really intimidating for a lay person, but we'll come to all that of that later. There are all kinds of animals and <laughs> vehicles and stuff. But you, uh, the kind of areas that you're working on, the borderline of probab improbability and impossibility, what are those? Well, so we're looking at things like next generation computing, uh, things like robotics, things like uh, the replacement for classical computing and the advent of quantum computers, which are which will be revolutionary. Uh, so all of those technologies require a real deep investment of capital and great engineering, but have huge consequences when they succeed. So what kind of model do you say huge amount of capital you put in the capital and you put in the training as well? It's a new kind of model actually that you seem to be working here. Right, so we put in, uh, we, we do put in conventional capital, but it's the human capital and the capital of experience that makes a difference. Uh, Which is so totally different from a VC, for example. Right, so we're the only VC in the world that have 50 engineers who've made the mistakes, who've built the products before, who know where the bodies are buried, that can allow our companies to focus on the new mistakes, to be able to build without you know, suffering the infant mortality or the basic simple problems that kill a lot of these companies. And let them put their intellectual capital and their actual capital uh, into building their, their core differentiation. Wow, so you, your experience and your team of 50, you said, is that? Wow. Uh, and they help people not make the conventional mistakes again. Right, and we can connect them with, you know, with technology, with ideas, with, with uh, recruiting help. Wonderful. with architectural oversight uh, and just good advice to keep them out of trouble. Wonderful. 
Uh, before we, I, I would like you to explain to the average person what quantum computing <laughs> you're doing and what it is. But before that, I'd like to, uh, you know, which which is the most uh, aggressive? Because I'm, you know, I need a bit of aggression. Well, I think they're all fairly aggressive. Some <laughs> of these, some of these <laughs> okay, have been in in movies, in Transformers, in, in the account. In movies. Yeah. Uh, so wow. they are. Uh, they don't encourage good behavior, um, <laughs> but they are quite beautiful pieces of, of sculpture. Um, wow, they are just beautiful. They beautiful. are a little too loud to ride indoors, but... Um, <laughs> you don't allow that, my God. But uh, they're, they're from different movies, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they're all, you know, they're, they're all one of a kind, um, and uh, they're all uh, not particularly fuel efficient. <laughs> right. So tell me, uh, back to... Um, uh, quantum computing. What, what? Give me an example of what you're trying to achieve with quantum computing. Well, when we have quantum computers, large-scale quantum computers, yeah. we can solve a number of problems which are long-standing problems uh, uh, in material science and in in medicine. Um, you know, a lot of things that we do today with, say, catalysts for making agriculture. Right. The 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 our ability to make um, fertilizer right. is, a, is a high temperature, high pressure process. We have no idea mechanically how it works. And we, pro we produce fertilizer with an extraordinary amount of energy and uh, bacteria do it at room temperature and we have no idea how that works. Oh, really? right, we right, simply right. don't understand that mechanism. Um, but with a quantum computer you can. You can go and actually do the engineering to create uh, to firstly, to understand the catalysts we have, but also create new ones which are enormously more efficient. So, with a quantum machine, an engineer can uh, create fertilizer at room temperature the way that biology does. Uh, wow. You know, we we don't you know how replicate biology, which is one of the most complex natural f forms of transformation, right? And we'll also be able to engineer mm -hmm. catalysts and materials that go well beyond what nature does. Right? We don't understand how photosynthesis works. We don't understand the yeah. mechanism of, um, a, a, at the core of photosynthesis. And we could design a process which does the same thing, which is enormously more efficient. We wow. could have buildings that literally sublime out of thin air. Trees do it. Trees are made of air. Right? There's no reason why we can't grow buildings the way nature grows trees. Grow a building. So, you know, there is carbon in the air, there's all the materials in the air required to build a building. You can imagine with the right catalysts and the right material science, having a nanotube building grow out of literally thin air, and in the process take carbon out of the air, which is something that's Wonderful. that I mean, has, a, has a key value. That is mind-blowing. So you, one day, when you've uh, done your research, so it's about to have another two months or so. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have a seed for a building. Plant the seed and you get a building. So wow. there's, there's no laws of physics that need to be broken. It's just engineering and having the right computation to do that engineering. Wow, that is mind-blowing. And you also mentioned you're working on optical computing. What, what do you mean by that? That's correct. So there's uh, one of the limitations of computing today is to move electrons around in, in, inside silicon takes an enormous amount of power and gen generates an enormous amount of heat. And there's limits as to how small you can make a device that's using electrons to do the computing. Uh, photons are much easier to move around. They're potentially much, much lower power. And you could do computation at a huge scale, which physically isn't possible with electrons in silicon. Um, so we have a number of efforts underway to use optics instead of electronics. Uh, to build next generation computers, uh, to build things that can accelerate machine learning and be many orders of magnitude faster than uh, really? conventional electronics. So give me an example of something that you're working on and, and the, the problem you're trying to solve, very specific. Well, yeah. If you're allowed I, to. <laughs> so th there are th some things I would love to be more explicit no, no, about. No, but, you can't. But, but for example, um, we had a company here that created the first silicon based neural network accelerator. Um, and uh, Intel acquired that company. And as machine learning becomes more and more a central workload um, in, in the cloud, uh, we recognize that there's a limit to how good it can be with transistors. So we have a company that's building a neural network accelerator which is entirely uh, doing the heavy lifting in optics and can be 
many, many, many times faster than its electronic equivalent. So when you talk about uh, a neural network and mm -hmm. machine learning and deep learning, uh, in lay terms, what would that mean? So uh, there has been a revolution in the way we construct software uh, that allows um, machines to do complicated tasks which up until now have been thought of as really only possible um, to do with, uh, with human intelligence. Uh, okay. And right. also algorithms that replace a lot of handmade code uh, with behavior which is learned directly by the machine. So for example, I think we've all seen the um, technologies that will look at a photo of a cat and recognize a cat or a dog and, uh, and its breed very difficult to design an algorithm to do right, that. Right, right, um, right. But now teaching a machine to do that is, is, is very straightforward. This is visual recognition. Right, so perception tasks. You know, and really what you're doing is taking a high dimensional space of this very abstract, complicated yeah. idea of a cat, yeah. and then training a machine to, um, to reduce that to a dimension of a cat or a dog or, or a person or a tree. And that's kind of eerie, right? It looks like the machine is intelligent, um, but it doesn't broadly apply to the deep intelligence that we have, to the general intelligence we have yet, and won't for a long time. And you get a lot of type one and type two errors, false positives, but as you get better, that gets reduced as it becomes more and more accurate. Yeah, so we're, we're still in actually early days for those kinds of technologies, and they do improve, and they are improving very, very quickly. We're getting good at training with things like this optical technology that can really uh, broaden the kinds of things you can recognize and the kinds of perception tasks you can, you can build. Um, but it will absolutely change everything about the way we write software to, to solve amazing, those kinds of problems. Amazing, it's really cutting edge stuff here, Anand. Uh, what, something you mentioned about uh, for health technology. Give us some examples of that. Yeah, so there's a number of different domains you can apply machine learning to. Right. Um, you know, the way we discover drugs for therapeutics is pretty artisanal at, at, at the moment. There's just yes. lots of guessing and testing and experimentation. Yes, yes. Um, and we're starting to see companies apply machine learning to that challenge. Um, machines are already better at certain oncology and pathology tasks than humans at recognizing, right. at recognizing yes. cancer, at, at, at recognizing what is or isn't a cancer, a cancer cell. Um, largely because machines can do you know, a, a doctor can only do a couple of hundred of those a year. Machines can do millions. millions. Um, That's very useful for India. Because yeah. we have, I mean, our doctors are most hardworking. They see the most patients, but they just have a little bit of time for each patient. Otherwise, it's a few versus uh, ignoring the rest. And this yep. could be transformational for a developing country, third world countries. And there's another, there's another thing that people don't really appreciate yet, and that is, an extraordinary doctor can create this knowledge during the course of his career, right. but when he leaves and when he dies, Very that knowledge true. goes with him. Very true. I if mean we you can impart only so much, 10%, but uh, yeah. That's yeah ma but point. machines can share each other's experience, wow. right? So wow. if we could read each other's minds and share each other's experiences and knowledge, we would organize our civilization differently. Wow. Machines can do that. So once they learn how to solve a particular problem in wow, medicine, or once they learn how to recognize a particular class of drugs, all machines know how to do that. And then share it with each other. Yeah. So it's a huge exponential amplification of the utility of those kinds of things. I don't know if this confidential, although there's a website that you're, one of the, your teams you're building up is reverses type two diabetes? That's correct. Wow. Yeah, so that's a, um, I'm, I'm actually type one diabetic myself. There's a, okay. uh, a way of using a different kind of uh, continuous care where coaches and doctors can work with patients to really change the outcome of type 2 diabetes. Right. Um, and, and the treatment is, um, it's a mix of coaching um, and, and diet and other interventions which are for the first time really dramatically change the way and it's the already disease progresses. Working? Yep, yep, right. there, are, there are patients currently wow. under treatment. Wow. Um, and um, is there a website that people can go to? And yeah, the company's called Verta Health. Verta Health. Verta Health, yeah. So and it's vertahealth.com. Uh, that's correct. And -E health.com. That's correct. Okay. And currently the treatment's available in uh, in North America, but it's an inspiring CEO, um, and I've never seen patient testimonials like that. Um, really? It's really a, wow. a really an extraordinary program. God bless you. 
Um, before we kind of come to a final point, um, driverless cars. Yes. You know, it's like the in thing these days. What's your take on that? Well, so driverless cars are interesting because it, it, it speaks to what we're talking about with uh, machine learning, that we've seen them do things which seem like human um, capabilities to recognize right. a cat, to be able to do these new perception tasks. And I think we've been seduced into thinking that applies to broader forms and deeper forms of human intelligence, right? The human priors to know how to get onto the Holland Tunnel or to navigate a, you know, an intersection in Mumbai, right? Okay. It's a very complicated human task which requires all human priors to get right. And we have been trying to make these driverless vehicles like independent sentient creatures um, to work the way we do to solve that problem. But they don't need to because they can read each other's minds. Oops. They can see I'm around sorry, this corners. This is pure coincidence. Yeah. Speaking of, this is an autonomous vehicle uh, who has been delivering donuts. Hey, come here, come here. Hello. Wow, and there's delivering one, donuts. There's one donut left. Well, actually, that is me because that's how <laughs> I started my career. I promise you, I used to go around the uh, office giving bread and cakes and coffee. That's great. Uh, so, but canvas, this, yeah. This is a very simple autonomous of vehicle, course, yes. and it doesn't have to deal with traffic and doesn't have to yeah. stare down somebody in an intersection to uh, to cross traffic. Do they um, like to be patted? Do they have? <laughs> no, well, they have buttons, but they don't. Uh, you know, they have yet. buttons, but not emotions. Um, <laughs> so tell me, back to uh, the driverless car. Um, there are different levels now, right? Yes. Of how good they are, and yes. what level are we at, and when will a driverless car? Will, when will it become actually implemented? So currently there are a series of um, affordances in a car for keeping you in your lane, giving you warnings when yes. you're approaching another car. And so these level one and level two features are available today. So right. um, cruise control and, and uh, there will be increasing features that make it more difficult for a car to run into another car, for a car to right. you know, drive into a um, That would be level or three or level four. Right, now when you get to level four and level five, there mm -hmm. is increasing autonomy of the vehicle that uh, doesn't require the human to do the driving. Now level five, the idea is it can drive anywhere under all circumstances and there's under no human. All circumstances. Right. Zero okay. human intervention. Yeah. And I think that is many decades away. Many decades, ah, oh, that's interesting. One step down, the vehicle almost always drives itself. Level four. Level four, and I think the challenge there is you can make a car that takes over when a human makes a mistake. Very difficult to make a car that makes the human take over when it makes a mistake. Very good point. And yeah. um, I think we've seen recent you know, yes, tragic yes. examples of mm -hmm. that, that I don't think you can do that. Now we've had a robot in vehicles for many years, which right. is really, really good at helping a human under certain circumstances. So if you look at anti-lock braking, is a robot that's really, really good at applying the brakes, far better than any human can. Um, and it does it by modulating the, the brake. He's off, you're not taking any cookies, nothing. <laughs> yes, I think it's going back to the kitchen for more donuts. <laughs> okay. Um, so okay, yeah. So there are anti-lock braking is a it's working well. And and I think the path to autonomy lies incrementally adding more robots like that, the ADAS, the right. driver assistance, right. the you know um, make sure the cars can't run into each other. Right. But I think there's another general way of approaching the problem, which is make these machines the mind readers they can be let them see around corners by seeing through each other's eyes and wow. collaborate with the cities that they're driving in. I think wow. that's the way you get to wow. uh, the scale. We're level five, but yep. we're at level four now. And level four is a no, little uh, dangerous. Too, yeah, level four is not, so there aren't, there aren't level Many four level vehicles. four yet, but mm -hmm. even at level four, if even 1% of the time you need a human to, over, to take over. That's really, that's, is, should that be allowed on the road? So there is, a, there is a body of thought that thinks level four should be illegal. Illegal. Right, and right, I think right. it's an intractable problem. Um, so I thought you thought there are no problems that are intractable. That's why you're going to get into this. Right? I think <laughs> there are always other ways of solving the problem. Yes, right? The problem is, yes, the problem yes, is autonomy. Yes. The problem is um, uh, you know, freeing people up from mundane tasks. Right. I think it's the implementation. There's always an implementation that works. Exactly, and exactly. I'm not sure this sentient autonomy is the right way of approaching it. Right, so you feel either level five certainly don't have level four running around the roads. Yeah, I, I, I think a autonomous system that almost always works is not an autonomous system at all. 
an autonomous system that almost always work is not autonomous. I think that's a really good point and I hope everybody hears that because it is worrying and that distinction is very clear, you made it. Last question in, uh, in the context of what next for you? Just lots of big ideas being cracked every day and new learning as you said? Yeah, I think that within these walls there are some absolutely revolutionary companies when they succeed, that will enable new companies and new industries to be formed. Uh, right. I've heard uh, one of the CEOs here say that he believes that the computing revolution hasn't happened yet. Um, I believe that. I also believe the industrial revolution hasn't really happened yet either. Uh, and the advent of next generation computing technologies and the, you know, the, the possibilities for engineering that follow that uh, really will change the way we work and live, um, create an extraordinary amount of wealth, create enormous opportunities for investment, um, and really change the way we live. Now you're saying there's a whole revolution to come, both in computing and just in technology. Just give us a glimpse of what the world is going to be like 15 years from now, and how the change, 50 may be a long time, I don't know, too long. Well, hopefully we're in an environment where we can reverse the damage we've done um, over the last couple of centuries uh, to be able to have more and more of the wealth population living in fair and equitable environments. Uh, in what way? Well, so to be able to have, to be able to create wealth, to be able to have high quality and expensive food, um, to be able to um, have you know, being able to grow buildings out of literally High out of thin air. High quality and expensive food is like huge for a country like India. Yeah, and huge. it's a, and we are uh, in a position to address the limitations of existing agriculture with things like, you know, understanding how to create um, fertilizer without at room temperature without you know the Haber process, for example, being able to apply um, practices for automation to be able to. Um, inexpensively address limits in, in labor to create the, to, yeah. to create the food. Um, engineering different kinds of um, plants that are adaptable to different, you know, different climates and, and, and different environments in the soil. More productive, um, lead cheaper costs. I mean, yep. it's, it's a, that's a revolution in agriculture in itself. Yeah, so I think there's, a, I think there's huge opportunities wow. for technology to address those kinds of, wow. those kinds of things. Um, and that the more people we put in a position to spend time being scientists and engineers, creating this kind of wealth, there's a positive feedback that, that addresses more and more of those problems, right? We are, I think India produces an order of magnitude more engineers than the U.S. does. Uh, the, yes. and, and science to some degree is under, under siege in the U.S. Um, but there is this great positive feedback loop with the right capital and the right engineers and people being able to concentrate on those kinds of problems. The opportunity to create wealth and, and you know, make it better for everybody is virtually unlimited. And wow. as I said, I think we're just at the infancy of these new computing technologies, which unlock material science and chemistry and medicine in fascinating ways. So I think you know, most of the good ideas haven't been had yet. Most of the interesting companies haven't been invested yet. Unbelievable. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we want to make a contribution to that as much as we can. God bless you and best of luck. So that's the magician Peter Barrett, one of the founders of Playground. Before we end this week's episode, let's look a little deeper into one of the products the Playground is creating. And I felt so proud to highlight this startup. It's called Inscopix, and it's headed by a brilliant young Indian, Kunal Ghosh. Let's see how Kunal is going to try and change the world. Kids like you, you make us proud. And uh, you, have a, you have a lot of work to do, and taking time off like that is wonderful. Thank you, sir. Tell me a little bit about your company. It's just inspiring. What's the name first? Inscopix. Inscopix. And what's the big picture that it's trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. So Inscopix is a neurotech company. Um, we're based right out here in Palo Alto, spun out of Stanford several years back. And we're founded with the mission to help decode the brain. Okay. So the brain's black box. We have very little understanding of, the brain's of how a black it works. Box. I love brain that. Brain is a black box. Right. And it has been a black box for decades. And that it, bad, is it? Yeah. And it's precisely because we know so little about how the brain works, let alone how it doesn't work, that 
we are where we are today with respect to brain diseases and mental illnesses. And the, the statistics are just mind-boggling. You know, something like one in 10 adults worldwide suffers from mental illness. Hundreds wow. of millions wow. of, of folks around the world, whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed. The global costs, I think, are something like three trillion the, on wow. society. And it's what it is today because we don't understand how the brain works. We don't have good treatments, let alone cures. So our thesis is to say that let's empower researchers around the world to address this knowledge gap. Let's demystify this black box, you know, enlighten researchers with our platform, our analytics. So you're studying and understanding the brain, which is like a huge breakthrough. Is that what you're doing? I like to say we're empowering the heroes out there okay. that are going Already. to be making the breakthroughs okay, okay. with our technology, with our analytics, with our personnel. We certainly are investigating some um, specific um, brain functions, some particular um, processes, but it's the heroes out there at universities, at research institutions, pharmaceutical companies that are using our tools, our products, and are trying to understand how we encode memories, how do we get addicted to substances, how okay. do we um, eat, you know, what are the behaviors that result in binge eating, that results in obesity, a big problem right, in the right, US. Right. These are all brain circuit problems. Yes, yes, and and yes. our platform is for the very first time literally shedding light. It's an imaging based device, so it's okay. literally shedding light on these circuits that no one understood how they gave rise to basic function we take for granted. And in the case of diseases like Parkinson's, together with drug companies, we're for the first time discovering how circuits are malfunctioning. And, and circuits in, in the brain. Brain circuits, how they're malfunctioning, right. giving wow. rise to the symptoms. Yes. And the hope here is that if we can understand how the circuits malfunction, we might be able to develop much better treatments that retune the circuit, you know, in, in some ways analogous to controlling blood pressure. Right. That if we can control blood pressure, a person can lead a long, healthy life, hopefully. Right, right not succumb to a cardiovascular disease. Right, right. And so if we you can do the similar kind of thing with different aspects of the brain. Exactly. That's the hope. Yeah, that yeah. once we demystify this black box, we'll understand better what to do to help so people. So what you're doing could, apart from understanding all these the binge eating, it also could help with Parkinson's and with um, Alzheimer's? Absolutely. In fact, um, that's the big um, opportunity that we have here at Inscopix and you know, for humanity, that if we can start understanding in a disease like Parkinson's, how is the Parkinsonian circuit in the brain malfunctioning? We can distinguish normal from abnormal. Then we might be able to empower drug developers, pharmaceutical companies, device developers, to do much better than sticking crude invasive electrodes in the brain. Um, very um, crude sledgehammer-like treatments is, is what we have Perhaps today currently. for Parkinson's. Yeah. This yeah. is the state Let today. Let me just bring you, I just was in Scopix. Uh, these are uh, one of your products, is it? Yes. And it, it looks pretty well developed actually already. Oh, Explain a bit of it just for a lay sure. person. So as I was mentioning, the technology actually spawned out of work we did back at Stanford. And this is the core of the, the platform. It's a miniature wearable microscope. Microscope. It, okay. it's, it's a microscope based technology with an integrated HD video camera. In, in many ways similar to the chipset that's in the camera that's currently photographing, filming us. So okay. <laughs> this device will be head mounted, um, not on human subjects yet, since right now we're empowering researchers to understand basic circuits that are malfunctioning in disease models with the hope of then translating to humans. But researchers will be able to watch with this device hundreds, thousands of neurons firing in real time during behavior. So you can really start studying the brain in action and visualize how brain circuits, neuronal processes, patterns give rise to behaviors. Interestingly, it's a camera. So it's, as you said, it's basically light, a brain cam. Visualize. Yes, exactly. So exactly. I mean, like, this would be fitted where? This would be head mounted uh, eventually. So like here or here or well, inside on the brain. on the cranium or inside or it could also be implanted in a minimally invasive way on the okay. structure that is being studied. Right now, it's for research purposes. Yes, so it's yes, on, yes. on research subjects, and it's used um, to understand, as I was saying, how you know specific neurons are encoding for for memories. Um, in the Parkinson's um, study that I was mentioning, this platform, this technology showed how in a particular animal model of Parkinson's, 
we knew exactly what was happening in the circuit that gave rise to the behavioral abnormalities. Okay. And this is the kicker, that most drug companies today rely only on these behavioral readouts, if you will, that are very crude, very coarse, and then most of the drugs end up failing in human because the animal behavioral model is no way a predictor of how well the drug will work in the clinic. Correct. With yeah. our technology, by looking at the brain circuit in vivo, we can now show literally how the compound, the drug, is working on the circuit. I and see. it's way more sophisticated than the behavioral readout, meaning that we can tell whether a drug will work or not, predict its clinical efficacy based on the circuit biomarker. So wow. it's wow. changing the paradigm in neuroscience, neurology, neuropsychiatry from looking at the brain just as a collection of chemicals. That's right. how we have yes, looked at yes. it. You know, inject some more dopamine or pull back some dopamine, that's how we treat patients, into looking at the brain as a big electrical network. And if we can decode this network, then we can understand how to retune the network with wow. precision therapeutics and hopefully improve the quality of life, if not curing you know, some of the diseases in the long term. Um, when do we think, like say, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's could benefit from this? Well, in Parkinson's, we already are in the process of conducting larger scale <coughs> research trials where we're starting to develop AI-driven methods to predict the accuracy or clinical efficacy of a compound already? or a device. Wow. And the hope is that in five to 10 years, some of these results will start translating into therapeutics that could be used in humans and, and hopefully do much better than anything and that's out Alzheimer's? there today. Alzheimer's, mental illnesses, um, <coughs> mental illnesses are extremely poorly understood. So at least a disease like Parkinson's, at least there are some therapies in the clinic. You know, we have deep brain stimulators, it might be crude. We have L-DOPA, might not be optimal, but at least there is something for early stage patients. You look at depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, there are no good therapies out there. Diagnosis is also very primitive. So this kind of a technology is extremely well suited to look at mental illnesses, understand how the circuits are being disrupted, and eventually... So what do you actually see? Just very you will see literally hundreds, thousands of neurons that are flashing. Okay. It's like stars in a night sky. Okay. So the brain lights up, and you see a bunch of neurons that are firing, and the patterns of firing result Matters. in the function or the behavior that we take for granted. Wow. That's a that's huge breakthrough. Well, that's, that's in Scopix, and, and that's our, our promise, that if we can start decoding these patterns of activity, let's first provide these patterns of activity. Let's allow researchers, pharmaceutical companies to see for the very first time the brain in action. You know, President Obama in his State of the Union said this probably more eloquently than I am <laughs> in, I think, 2013, that this three-pound mass between our ears you know, is a mystery. But if there is a way to start unlocking this, this mass, if there is a way to literally study the brain in action, to visualize the brain in action, then we will be hopefully at the, the next phase of, of human evolution, where we're Wonderful. finally starting to demystify this organ, conquer brain diseases, and just improve the state of the world. And Scopix today is one of the few uh, companies, at least, that is r literally empowering researchers to, to do that, and to study the brain in playground. action. We're part of Playground. We love the fact that Playground invests in platform companies, and, and that's what Inscopix is. It's Wonderful. a platform for, for mapping the brain and eventually, of course, for enabling the development of next generation therapeutics. Kunal, you'll be successful, you're Bengali, so there's no <laughs> question. <laughs> Good luck and God bless you for Thank working you, Dr. in Roy. such an important area. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I appreciate Thank it. You. My pleasure. That's the amazing Kunal Ghosh. And as an Indian, I felt so proud of him and his team, changing the world of medicine. In fact, new technology, deep learning, and artificial intelligence applied to medicine is a major thrust area in the playground and across the entire Bay Area, in fact. It promises to be very important for India and developing countries. We have a shortage of doctors, and with these amazing new technology tools for diagnosis and for treatment, all at a much cheaper, affordable price, people in rural areas and small towns of India will get access to much better medical care. A revolution in medicine for all of us, and especially for the poorest, is about to happen, and it's coming very, very soon. Some by as soon as next year, perhaps.
Now in our next episode of Playground, we shall demonstrate real robotics, artificial intelligence, and how all that is changing the world. Don't miss it.